Okay, we'll give it another minute or so. I still see some people coming in. Um, so we'll give it just another minute or so before we get underway tonight. All right, it's a little after five, so I think we should get started. Uh, as many of you may already know, my name is Robin Starr, and I am the head of American and European Works of Art here at Skinner's. We are delighted to have you here this evening. Uh, as many of you know, uh, here at Skinner's, we are quite busy. We have over 80 auctions every year. Obviously, we have many in fine art, my particular favorite, but uh, we hold auctions in everything from Asian works of art to jewelry, to wines and spirits, to modern design, uh, Americana, musical instruments, books. Uh, we have coins. We have a wonderful range of auctions for all. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes first and foremost, if you are on Zoom, which you must be if you can hear me, uh, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, in the little bar at the bottom, you will see a Q&A feature. Uh, we will be uh, doing some questions at the end of Dr. Duffy's talk. Uh, so just type your questions in there and uh, I'll sort of go through those and I can ask those directly to our, our speaker. Uh, if we don't get to your question, or if you think of another question in the middle of the night tonight, uh, please feel free to uh, email us with other questions. Uh, you can send that to info at skinnerinc.com, or you can give us a, a jingle at 508-970-3206, and we'll do what we can to answer your questions. Uh, it's my honor now to uh, introduce to you Dr. Henry J. Duffy. Uh, he is our speaker for this evening. He's a historian of 19th century painting and sculpture and an authority on the works of Augusta St. Gaudens. He's a frequent lecturer, a commentator on numerous cable and television networks, including PBS, uh, Arts and Entertainment, and ESPN. Uh, Dr. Duffy received his undergraduate degree from Drew University, uh, his MA from Williams College, uh, and his PhD from Rutgers University, and he's held many, many uh, important positions in the art world, including uh, positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the New York Historic Society, the uh, National Historic, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and most recently at the National Park Service, where he served as curator for the St. Gaudens National Historic Park. Uh, he's published extensively, and he's curated museum exhibitions on a variety of 19th century topics, uh, and before we begin, I just want to say he also deserves special praise and combat pay as he's a little bit under the weather tonight. His voice is not as strong as he had hoped. Uh, so uh, hopefully it will remain strong throughout the lecture, but if it cracks a little bit um, to our audience, just know that he's, he's muscling through it and we very much appreciate that. And here we are to enjoy uh, his, his discussion this evening, St. Godin's iconic portrait of President Abraham Lincoln, man and legend. I give you Dr. Duffy. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, we've um, um, hit the park, we've had a long um, connection with Skinner's through the years um, with St. Godin's uh, not only sculpture, but uh, his coins, um, which are still highly sought after and are pieces that are still um, commanding very high, high prices. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting and, and long connection between the park and Skinner's and we're happy to have had that relationship. So let's, we can start out here, go to the first slide there. Um, <clears throat> um, you'll see the text is written along the side because I'm gonna try to hold on to my voice. I won't go through all that. You can read along, but I'll just make a few comments and 
then if you, there's something that I'm not getting, you can let people know through the through the chat, and I'll go back to it. Um, <clears throat> but um, St. Gordon's um, association with Lincoln was a long one. Um, he was not, it was not just a quick commission to do this piece. It was something that developed through a long time. Um, and it's something that he really was um, intensely personally involved with. Um, <clears throat> you see the photograph of a very young Lincoln. This was taken <clears throat> at the time of the Cooper Union speech. And um, it's amazing to me, it's a big space. There were well over a thousand people in the audience and he just got up and belted it out. There no microphones, no, you know, no jumbo trombi. I mean, I mean, no, 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 nothing. It just, just him standing there with his hand on a law book talking. Um, and he was running for president, but he was not the nominee when he came for this speech. Um, so that was in the back of his mind. He chose to give a very crisp legal brief on the question of whether the federal government has authority over the states in matters of slavery. And he kept his speech to that and he did it in a very bland, um, legalistic kind of way. There was none of the Shakespearean poetry that would come later in his speeches. It was, it's actually <clears throat> a marvel of a political speech because it was calculated to give something to everybody to not uh, offend anyone. Um, well, it worked because he went in a, a relative, nobody, and he came out the triumphant hero of Rome. I mean, he came out, people were practically carrying him out. Um, and it was because people liked that he was giving clear, straight <clears throat> answers to complicated questions. So um, one of the people in the room was this little boy named Augustus St. Gardens, who was swept away by it as well. Um, he remembered that experience and it wasn't very long after when the a much less um, joyous event took place, the ceremonial funeral for the president. And um, that was an, an enormous parade that went up Broadway from the um, um, wharves at uh, lower Manhattan. <clears throat> and he um, followed along, waited in an endless line to see the president and was so carried away by it that he did it all over. He just went back to the end of the line, waited another uh, several hours and went back. So um, if you can go to the next picture, we can go to the next, next slide. Okay. When it came time later for him to do the, um, um, well, is that, is that bothering people? All right. Um, so when it came time uh, to do this um, um, sculpture, he already had an image of the man in his mind. Um, St. Gardens, whom you're looking at here. Um, oh, geez. Um, Oh, Life just, often goes on. 
doesn't it? Life just always let, goes on. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> we'll just let them do their thing over there. Um, so, yeah, goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Oh, God, she's doing it again. All right, anyway, um, thorough, isn't she? All right, so anyway, St. Gaudens, who became really the definition of American art in sculpture, was not American. He was Irish. He was a Dubliner. Um, and he was born in 1848, which of course was the year of the famine. Not a good year. His father was um, from the Pyrenees in Southern France. And his mother was Irish from just west of Dublin. His mother's family was in the plaster business, which Maybe, maybe that's something that made sculpture seem appropriate to him, I don't know. But um, it was certainly connected. Um, and um, they came when he was six months old. And we don't often think of how, um, the, what's involved with a thing like that. They had had two sons before him, both of whom had died. He was six months old when they were going to make this trip. They had some problem with getting on the ship. So by the time they got to the wharf, the ship was gone and they were disappointed. But that ship never was seen again. So they took, still took another boat to America. So it's, it's, Amazing, you know, when you think of the the power of the need that makes immigrants do these things, um, and for him to make it because they were in the steerage, and a baby in steerage wasn't much chance he would survive. He did. It, it just the whole thing is amazing <laughs> that it all worked, and he grew up in New York, and eventually was able to go to France for training and to Italy um, and then back to start his career. Um, because he lived in New York, many of his best pieces are there. Um, the Randall on Staten Island, the Farragut in Madison Square, um, the um, Sherman, the bottom of the park, Central Park. Um, and um, he um, um, was, he became more and more active, not just as an artist, but as a um, cultural icon. Um, he also <clears throat> understood marketing before that was a thing. He hired a photographer. So, <clears throat> All the images of him are by his photographer, DeWitt Clinton Ward, and they are meant as iconography. Um, it's not, it's selling, not just this is a guy who makes art, but you look at this image and it's selling, this is the grand woman. You know, this is the great man. This is the the um, sage. I mean, this is so they're building a um, legend as they go along. It's amazing that he had that sense in them. Um, next picture. Um, <clears throat> I like this one. I, I call this one Lincoln with a cowlick. Um, what this is, is um, a, a ward photo of one of the many um, um, studies that were made after St. Gaudens received the commission for the standing Lincoln in 1884. Um, and he did the work in Cornish, New Hampshire. Most of his other pieces were done in Paris or New York, but 
but the Lincoln was done entirely in Cornish. Um, so it's really a, you know, we think of it as a Chicago work, but it's really a New Hampshire work. We can claim it as a New England piece. Um, and I like that <clears throat> the man who brought him to Cornish was his lawyer who said, oh, come on up, I'll find you a Lincoln-shaped man to um, be a model. And they did. They found this man who's described in the traditional biographies as a farmer, but he wasn't a farmer. He was actually a state senator, um, this Langdon Morse. He had the same craggy features. I think this is his only shot at heart. I don't know what he must have thought when some stranger met him on the sidewalk and said, I want to pay you to come and stand and be Lincoln. I, I don't know, but he did it. Um, and we see in this St. Gordon's drive for perfection, even going to the amazing degree of finding Lincoln's tailor and having a suit made from the specifics of Lincoln's actual suit. So Morse was wearing basically the president's clothes for this thing, which is this amazing detail. Um, the face and the hands were fortunate because the Volk life mask and hands um, were rediscovered at that time and given to St. Gardens. And when he was through with them, he arranged the subscription to have them go to the um, Smithsonian. There were about 35 subscribers. So there are, you know, copies from those that have been made um, through the years. They come up um, on auction periodically and they have a wide range of um, prices. Um, I've seen ones that are pretty close to the original that are, you know, have enormous prices on them, but then there's others that you can get much more easily. St. Gardens worked from small to large. So he would do these little sketches first to try to um, work out how he wanted the man to be seen. If we go to the next slide, this is what he ended up with. Now, what you're looking at is clearly not small because there's the artist on the left, left side, but um, this is the clay version. So the way, the way this works, when he gets the little size that he likes, um, and he would have been working in what is um, seen behind Robin right now. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this version that St. Gardens would have made. And then <clears throat> from that, he would make it in clay, cast it in plaster at the St. Gardens National Historic Park. We have that plaster. <clears throat> from there, it's enlarged. Now, what you're looking at there is not all clay. It can't be, it wouldn't hold up. There's actually very little clay in it. The chair and the figure are made of wood or in some cases steel called an armature. And so there's a structure underneath which gives the skeletal shape of the thing. Clay is put over that and then corrected. So you get what you're looking at here. Um, and you can see in the text there how carefully he copied Lincoln's pose. And um, the reason that he did that <clears throat> is the reason that um, the son of Lincoln, Robert Lincoln, um, <clears throat> thought that this was the best, most lifelike image of his father ever made, <clears throat> which is high praise because you know there's thousands of Lincolns out there, but um, 
This is the one that his son thought was the closest to his father. Um, the next, next slide. <clears throat> Here's the dedication. Um, I, you know, it's too far away to tell which is which, but um, the people on the far left sitting down there at the base of the statue, it's St. Gaudens and his wife, and it's Robert Lincoln and his wife. Um, they had both brought their children with them. This is the little boy, Abraham, in, in the small image, um, and Homer, who was the um, son of the St. Gaudens. Um, they were tearing around um, while um, Lincoln's law partner, um, Herndon, was giving his speech, which was apparently one of the longest on record. He just, the poor man <clears throat> had his public form and he was gonna tell every story he could remember about Lincoln and, oh my God, I've tried to read it. I can't even read it. It's, it's too long, but um, all interesting, but too much. Um, anyway, like large events, sometimes they go well, sometimes they don't. Um, there was about 10,000 people who crowded the base of the park for this thing. They weren't expecting that much. It was cold, rainy. It was, the statue was covered with a flag. The little boy, little Abraham Lincoln, was supposed to unveil. And he went out there, pulled on the rope, and it was too heavy. He couldn't get it. And so after a couple seconds, his father got up and went over and helped him and pulled it um, down, got the thing off of there. And what often happens in sculptural dedications, it takes a while for people to figure out what they're looking at. So the first few moments, there was dead silence and St. Gaudens was sitting there fidgeting, saying they hate it, it's a mistake, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> but he needn't worry because then there was just this vast explosion of sound from the crowd, which gave the military guard in the park behind the sign to start the 21 gun salute. Over on the right, you see a carriage with horses. And you see why this failed. The horses are facing away from all that. <clears throat> they were used to people sound, but when you get those cannons going off right in back of them, it was too much. They rose in the traces, took off with the carriage overturned. They went into this crowd. They were dragging through the crowd. It was a disaster. But they finally managed to get control of it. Um, just a disaster. But it all came together and um, the thing was done. And why do we not know anything about Abraham Lincoln II, because unfortunately, um, he died just uh, two or three years later. Um, he had gotten a cut that became infected, and this was before antibiotics. <clears throat> they didn't know how to cure it. So, um, there was actually a photograph taken of the little boy on his deathbed. And I was looking at that, and then I thought, oh, too grim. I don't want to, but, but if you're interested, you can actually look that up. But I mean, I thought, no, no, I don't want to depress people. But um, it's, um, anyway, so much for Abraham. He was buried in um, Arlington Cemetery with his father. His father was a Civil War veteran and permission was given for the boy. So people sometimes wonder when they go to, Arlington, why do I see Abraham Lincoln there? But it's this Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> um, next picture. Um, so St. Gaudens 
there are two versions, <laughs> Stand, standing and sitting, um, both done in Cornish. Um, the seated one was done before his death, but it was just not organized until much later. So it didn't get dedicated until 1924. Um, you'll notice that the pose looks familiar. Um, when people come to the park, they often say, is that the one in Washington? And um, I, th I think there's a connection there because Daniel Chester French and St. Gardens were very good friends. St. Gardens was instrumental in helping French get that commission. So I think that the pose was in some way an homage to St. Gardens. Um, I think that's why it's so much alike. But it's the unknown Lincoln. When you go to Chicago, everyone goes to the standing one and the seated one is not that far away, but people don't see it. Um, next picture. After the creation of it, it was a popular image. So there were numerous casts of it made. The first one in 1920 was done again with the involvement of Robert Lincoln, who had been um, ambassador to England. <clears throat> and this was given as a sense of thanks and friendship. Um, for the connection between America and Britain in World War I. Um, the next one to be made is the one that's over on the right there in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, it's a war memorial from 1936. And because of um, cost, they decided to do only the man and not the chair, which is a little Goofy. Um, <clears throat> there's a <laughs> there's a we we there's a reason you do <laughs> you don't mess with artists' work anyway. But that was done. There's one in the cemetery in California, uh, Forest Lawn, and there's one <coughs> Mexico City. <coughs> Things were <coughs> it's a little different time. America was seeking um, Mexican friendship because of the Cold War <laughs> and the knowledge that the Russian missiles were in Cuba, they didn't want them coming to Mexico. But so this was given to Mexico, the head of it, just the head was cast separately and given to President Johnson. You will still see it in the Oval Office behind the president. Almost every president has it. Um, and um, when he received that gift in 1964, Johnson used it to unveil his landmark civil rights agenda. Um, so it, this piece plays an important role in history. Um, next picture. <clears throat> now we get to the small images. This is uh, the one at the Metropolitan Museum. You can see it's very similar to the one at Skinner's. Now, um, how does this work? Well, as I said before, <clears throat> you can do this in different ways. Nowadays, 
artists will often take a large work and mechanically reduce it and sell that. And that's fine. <clears throat> as long as it's the artist doing it, it's fine. Or if it's something that's um, set. Um, <clears throat> with Rodin, he gave the French government the authority to make casts of his work in different sizes. So I mean, as long as there's some connection, that's fine. But these are different. And that's why the St. Gordon's reductions often um, command strong prices because they're not just a reduction. They're just not just a mechanical thing. This is based on the plaster version that St. Gordon's made in 1884 that was in his studio. So the fact that the bronzes come after his death doesn't really matter because they're done from um, as close as you can get. They're cast from the piece that's in his studio. So it's, and it's done by the same people who did the original. Um, his, when St. Gardens died in 1907, his wife um, kept the studio going for financial reasons. <clears throat> she was smart enough to know, don't mess with it. So she kept the employees of St. Gardens studio on the payroll and had them continue to make these. So they're as close as you can get to something as really in, actually made by St. Gardens. Um, and I say in the text on the side here, there was, this was something that artists came to slowly in America because <clears throat> they didn't want to make these things like little um, tchotchkes, like little decorative things. So they wanted them to be actual art. And St. Gardens um, did that to a strong degree. So that each one of these is really a separate work of art. Um, you can go to the next. <clears throat> Here's the version at the Henry Ford Museum. And you can see they come in different, um, some of them don't have a base, some have a very elaborate base. I've seen marble bases, I've seen granite bases, um, wooden, so that's the, you know, the buyer's um, choice, what they want. And that doesn't affect it. Um, that doesn't affect it. Um, the, the only thing that I'm gonna say is um, if you have a thing like this, don't put it outside um, and don't put it on the floor. Um, I don't wanna tell you, but I've found more than one on the floor, it's, it's all right, but just better not to. Um, all right, the next, next slide. <clears throat> I love this one. I call this the levitating Lincoln. Um, it's actually a, um, a, just a funny picture <clears throat> because the base is dark as well as the background. This is another war picture of the large studio in Cornish. It doesn't exist anymore, but <clears throat> you see that St. Gardens had the Lincoln in the studio uh, until he died. Um, next picture. Um, so up in the top um, left is the park version of the small Production. Now this picture is a little bit enlarged. So he's, the, the proportion is a little funny there, but it's not at, in reality, it's fine. Um, but this one is probably, this cast is probably from about um, um, 1912. The one at the Met is the earliest one found to this date. It's probably about 1911, um, but the, Mechanical reductions started about 19, 
10 or 11 and went, as far as we know, um, not much past 12, 13, so on, because they didn't go past the First World War. Um, <clears throat> there's about 20 of them that we know about <clears throat> in public and private collections, but there's always new ones showing up. Um, a colleague of mine not long ago discovered one in Havana, Cuba. So who knows? Um, who knows? Um, um, he did not, St. Gardens did not do numbered editions, which makes the job for curators and, and um, people like Robin really difficult because it would be nice if there was a specific number. But he didn't do that because he wanted each one, he wanted to focus on each one as an individual. So none of them are numbered. So we don't know how many were made. Um, they, where I'm ending is down in the corner there. The last version of the large one to be cast came at the park in 2016 as a celebratory year. And it makes sense since the piece was made in Cornish that it should end there. Um, one of the things that was wonderful for me as a curator, and it took a good 10 years to get this thing done because you can imagine a 20 foot statue <clears throat> on about a six foot base takes time. Um, it, there were a lot of partners. I list some of them there. Um, it was a lot of effort, but we corrected <clears throat> an element in the Chicago cast that was cast differently. Um, and so we had to decide since that's the original, is that the right one or is that the wrong one? And we decided that somebody had messed with it at one point. Nobody knew this, but somebody at one point, something happened and it's fortunately was in the back and somebody patched up a correction and it wasn't right. So we were able to correct that in our version. Also the um, patina, the finish on the Chicago one has been so badly handled through the years. <clears throat> you had no way to know what it really looked like. So I was able to go back and research 19th century finishes and find that this dark brown is the one that it should have been. Um, so, it, so we were able to bring back a pretty accurate version of what the piece looked like in 1887 when it was first dedicated um, in Chicago. So um, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of amazed that I made it through there, but thank you. Um, thank you for your patience with my scratchy voice. We want to thank you for persevering. That was, that was terrific. Um, so thank you so much for, for pushing through. Uh, if, if your voice can take it, we have a couple of questions. Now, some of these have been answered. Um, somebody had, several people have asked about the relationship between St. Gaudens and uh, Daniel Chester French, which you mentioned. Um, <laughs> would you mind speaking a little bit to the process of how an artist might miniaturize um, a bronze? I know you were saying that these were taken from the plaster in his studio, but certainly others have been miniaturized and that's a very common practice. Could you just sort of walk us through that technique a little bit? Yeah. Um, so, um, um, yeah, the reduction, as I, as I said, is done differently with St. Gardens than with almost, well, no, can't say all others, but with most other artists. Um, <clears throat> most other artists would just want to get the piece done. They would have a small piece 
in their studio, but that's a working piece and they're not gonna show the public that. <clears throat> so what happened in St. Gordon's situation is that after he died and his wife decided to continue making these, <clears throat> she would find those studio studies and it to the assistants who had worked with St. Gardens <clears throat> and would say, clean it up, make it look perfect. And they would do that. She would give her approval um, and then it would be cast. Um, and um, so that's how that um, worked for him. And it does add this um, personal sense, which is a little stronger connection than you will often get. <clears throat> and now what was the other part of the question? Um, people were just curious if you could sort of speak to how an artist would normally do a reduction as opposed to how oh, St. God. Okay, started. normally um, you would do this in the foundry. Um, and the foundry is the place where the metal is poured. <clears throat> to do that, you make a mold. And if it's a full piece, like a 20 foot statue, there's more than one mold. And you cast them, you, you, you make these molds you pour the liquid metal into it, and then when they're done, they're assembled and welded together and finished. You can go in the opposite direction. Once you have those molds, you can make a positive cast in plaster. <clears throat> and then you go to a mechanical um, enlarging, reducing machine that will make it bigger or smaller. And then you cast it again. So it's a, it's a lot of steps, but, but that's how you would normally do it. And so normally when this is done, the artist doesn't really have any part in it. It's just done by the foundry. It's a mechanical process and they just do it. Um, and that's what you get with artists who were not really sculptors like Picasso, <clears throat> where you get Picasso sculptures and you think, well, he made ceramics and stuff, but he didn't really make sculptures. So that's something that's made in a foundry somewhere. Um, with his approval, you know, he would say, you know, I bet that would sell, run me off. I mean, I even saw um, <clears throat> at Kike at the Rockefeller house, um, carpets. Um, Rockefeller wanted Picasso carpets. So they made him carpets. Um, you know, so and that can be done mechanically um, and they're fine. It's not that they're, they're, they're works of art. They're not, you know, that's not, um, bad, it's fine. Um, but um, that's that's the the other side of it. Hmm. That's so interesting. Um, can you tell us uh, what the variety of sizes is of um, what other sizes were made of of the Lincoln, the standing Lincoln? <laughs> um, primarily, just these two. Okay. They made versions of what's called the bust, which is the torso, neck, head. Um, there's two versions of that. And then there's one version of just the head. And the head is the one I mentioned that you see at the White House. But I, and I was scrolling through some of the uh, chat and that's also the one that's at the um, um, Lincoln, um, uh, the foundation 
that gives that to people. Um, and um, that's the same cast. Okay, is that referring to, we had a question about the, um, the Gilder Learman uh, Lincoln yes. Prize. So that's, yes. so that's the same one. Yeah. Okay, so that's the one you were referring to. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned that the cast in at Cornish in 2016 is the last one. Does that mean that none will ever be made again? Why is this the last one or is this just the most recent one? Something um, interesting to know. <coughs> in general, one doesn't want to make posthumous casts um, because you are, in essence, putting words in the artist's mouth. I mean, you're assuming that the artist <clears throat> would want more casts. Um, <clears throat> the one at the park we did because it was a celebratory gesture and because it really needed to be there. And it was um, part of a more complicated process. The, um, that large plaster version <clears throat> was in terrible shape. It had been sent to Mexico to make that cast, brought back, never taken out of the crates. So it was the same crates from 1964 um, with, um, um, what's that? Um, what's that straw stuff they used to pack things in? Um, it's got a name, anyway. Anyway, well, the Mexican mice loved it. Um, so we had trace, anyway. So um, <clears throat> the, the first phase was to use Park Service funding and Park Service staff from Gettysburg to restore that plaster. And then from that, the metal casting we used, uh, we did not use um, public, well, we used different public money. We did not use Park Service money. We used private donations. We used um, money from the New York State Council uh, and from the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts um, and um, from other sources. That, so that was a private um, funded thing. Um, and um, so we used public funds for the restoration of the original and private funds for the creation of the new cast. And um, we were lucky that that uh, granite base was uh, donated by Rock of Ages, just wonderful because um, <clears throat> a massive piece of granite like that um, would be a lot of money. Um, there was a funny thing, if you might have noticed, Abraham Lincoln is chiseled on the front <clears throat> the day that that was set into the ground. And there's the same amount under the ground as you see on top, um, because it has to reach down below the frost level. <clears throat> we had a hundred foot crane and it was up this massive boulder and it's going along and it's coming down. And I noticed that the Abraham Lincoln was on the back. So I went up to the foreman and said, no, 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 stop, stop. <laughs> and he was glad because he said, no, this is the kind of job you do once, you don't do it twice. Um, you, once a piece of stone like that is in the ground, it's there, it's never moving again. Um, so um, anyway, but yeah, it's amazing how much goes into a thing like this. Um, and that's true with all large public monuments. Um, um, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And that's why public monuments are so much money. Mm -hmm. Speaking of public monuments, someone's asking if you can talk about the vandalism to the, uh, the St. Gaudens uh, Civil War Monument in Boston. Um, 
Ja. <clears throat> I think there's I think there's vandalism and there's um, people expressing pain. And I think at the park, we recently had an example, unfortunately on the tomb of St. God <clears throat> that was vandalized with anti-Semitic comments. That's vandalism. I think expressing pain is something else. Um, because I have been um, fortunate to be a part of the committee that was working on the restoration of the Shaw in Boston and the ceremony that will come, we hope, in the spring um, for it. I think everyone felt that it was just in the wrong location, that putting it on the monument itself was not the right place because that's already about pain and sacrifice. Um, and I don't know that the people who wrote on that necessarily knew it. Um, I think they just saw an open, space and they're expressing themselves. So what was done is blank open, blank panels were set up next to it, um, inviting people to write um, so that it just gives people a better place to express um, their anguish um, in a more um, um, open way, not in a not in not in the same way of doing something. I don't I don't think that was meant to be um damage. <clears throat> uh, somebody else is asking uh, about the painting behind you, Dr. Duffy. Who is that oh, by? Me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um and that's a um it's a painting of the park and myself and a, a friend standing on the grounds there who was one of the sculptors um, uh, at the park who went on to do a number of great public monuments himself um, in the style of St. Gardens. Um, so that's what that is. Um, several people have been kind enough to tell us that the packing material that you're referring to is called Excelsior. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. We also found Mexican cornflakes in the crate. <laughs> um, I didn't know they had cornflakes, but they do. And um, <laughs> it's um, anyway, the, somebody must have eaten it and just had the box and just threw it in the crate, figuring in. Eh, it's going to another country, let them worry about, I don't know. But um, anyways, it was funny when we opened this up, you know, it's like an archeological you know, thing to see what are we gonna discover. Um, fortunately, the mice were long gone. Um, that, that was good. <clears throat> <laughs> speaking, speaking of occupants at, at Cornish, how large was the colony at Cornish at its height? Um, there were maybe 25, 30 people. Um, it was constantly changing. Um, but yeah, it started in St. Gardens time in the late 1880s and it continued on after his death, but was over by the time of the first world war. Mm -hmm. Although there are still artists in the area. Yeah. <clears throat> they're just not organized in a group, but there certainly are still artists here. Yeah. And, and are there still artists in residence there today? Yes. Does the um, happen? Yes. 
We do that every year. Um, Zoe Dufour was the artist for the last two years. Um, the first, her first year was the COVID year. So she did it um, virtually from um, California, but fortunately last year she was able to do it in person at the park. It's a wonderful uh, program, wonderful way for people to actually see an artist doing these things that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody's asking if you can see our version of the Lincoln close up. Um, I can maybe as we sort of wrap things up, I can try to show some images of it with my iPad if people would like. Um, before I start to do that, are there any other questions for Dr. Duffy, who you've been a trooper. We, we really appreciate you sticking with us with that voice. Ugh. It's very much appreciated. Thanks. Any last questions? It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'll take, I'll take a, us on a walk over here um, and see if I can show this off a little bit better. Um, and anybody who does want to come see it, you're more than welcome to do so. Here is our. He is. Yes. <laughs> so if I turn it sideways, hold on. <laughs> but here you go. You can see a pretty good view of him. And his very distinguished contemplative look as he yes. sort of considers what he might say to his public. And that wonderful chair behind him. Let me see if I can get a good view of that for you that chair of state, we're, we're not to call it a throne, that's my understanding, it is sort of a chair to represent the strength of, of the state of the American government. Is that, do I have that more or less right? Yes. <laughs> you can sort of see it from behind. And I would encourage anybody who wants to come see it, just give us a call or set up an appointment online and you can come and, and see him in the flesh. He really is pretty terrific. The detail is just stunning all the way down to his shoes. And you can see the wonderful detail in his, his waistcoat, even the crinkles of his suit and the fold in his lapel. It really is a wonderful, wonderful piece. So we encourage everybody to come visit it. And I think with that, I think we should probably call it an evening. You, you've, you've given plenty to us with that voice. We very much appreciate it. So I want to thank you again. And I want to thank all our attendants as well for staying with us and listening. And we hope to see you all here very soon. So thank you again, Dr. Thank Duffy, you. For, for being thank with you us again. tonight. It was thank a pleasure. You.